Hi all, welcome to our February session of Edinburgh R. Uh, this evening we're going to welcome Dave Evans and Eric Nance uh, to speak. Uh, so first off we're going to take Dave Evans who uh, is the first data scientist at FreeAgent and currently leads the data science and analytics teams. Before joining FreeAgent, Dave worked at the University of California, San Diego and CERN and he's going to speak to us about the unintended consequences of machine learning. You take it away Dave. Cheers. Hi, so can everyone see my screen? That's good. Okay, let's see if I can work out. If I do present, can you see my slides full screen now? All good. Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. So th thanks for the introduction, Mike. Um, and also apologies to anyone who saw my room in the background. I've just moved house, so there's a, a great deal of mess everywhere. And perhaps as a as a side note, I should remember for next time not to volunteer to give a talk in the same week I'm moving because it turned out to be a lot of work. But uh, this is this is based on a bit of work I did in the past, so I kind of had all the all the results. Now I, I wanted to share it because I thought it made quite an interesting talking point. So first of all, uh, about me, I mean, thanks thanks for the introduction, um, Mike. I, maybe we don't we can just skip over this, but I mean, I was the first data scientist at FreeAgent back in 2013 and I was initially working in the, in the comms team on my own. I spent a lot of time on customer simulations, lifetime value modeling. I built some of our first data platform type applications. I built our first data warehouse, which is now sort of getting retired, which is quite interesting to see. I, I went more in the management direction in, in 2015. I became the analytics team lead. You know, we started to think about introducing more machine learning into both the workflows we do to support the business and to help our customers as well. And I kind of became the lead of, of two teams around the beginning of, of last year. We kind of split out an analytics function that focuses on you know, the more statistical modeling and business intelligence side and a data science team that are focusing on introducing some machine learning driven features into the application. So basically what I do now is, is pretty much go to meetings, but I do still try to do a little bit of analysis where and when I can. And back when I started at FreeAgent, I used R primarily for all of the, the data analysis that I did. And while you know there's a few different tools in, in use now, I think for me, I would still use R for any kind of quick exploratory analysis. I find it very concise and, and very easy to use. So a little bit about FreeAgent. So for those of you who don't know, FreeAgent is a software as a service product that's designed to help small businesses uh, with their accounting and day-to-day -day bookkeeping and admin. So you know, with FreeAgent, you can file expenses, you can send invoices, you can check your cash flow, you can check your, your tax timeline. The idea is you know, you can, as we say here, this, this tagline, take care of business from anywhere. So we have a mobile app and we have a desktop app as well. And, uh, you know, FreeAgent now is part of the, the NatWest group. So, you know, we do a lot of work with bringing on board uh, small business customers from the bank, as well as our direct acquisition of customers who can sign up through our website and our work with accountancy practices who use FreeAgent to work with their clients more effectively. So FreeAgent itself, technologically speaking, is a, a Ruby on Rails app. And we, re we recently migrated into AWS, so that's been Something's been really, really exciting for us and has opened up a lot of new sort of technological opportunities. But that's that's not really the subject of this talk. Um, so what what about this talk? Well, I, I think I've got a bit of a history of going to meetups and sort of giving talks that on the face of it aren't really about the subject that, that the meetup is about. So is this talk really about R? Um, my answer to that is well, sort of. So I'll describe an analysis that I did over the course of couple of afternoons last year to investigate a problem that was reported by the comms team. And to do the analysis, I used R, but I also used a, couple, a few other things. I used Looker, which is a business intelligence tool that we now use extensively. So we have most of our data that we use in the analytics team in Redshift. And Looker is the tool that lets uh, anybody in the business easily construct queries based on that data and look at results. Uh, I use Ruby, so as I mentioned, FreeAgent is a Ruby on Rails application. So I had to write a bit of Ruby to extract some of the data from the application database. And I did a bit of by hand manipulation of, of the data in, in Google Sheets. 
So is this talk really about machine learning? Well, again, I'm going to sort of say, well, well, sort of. Uh, I did create a model of sorts. I'm going to talk about that model. But ultimately, it, it wasn't used in production. But what I did find was that the model made a really great illustration of what machine learning does, you know, how it works and where it might go wrong. It got some really good engagement from other members of the engineering team. And I've used it a bit as a sort of internal talking point inside the company. And I, I wanted to share that here and see what you guys uh, all think about it. So what was the beginning? Well, well the beginning was about, about a year ago, maybe a little bit more than a year ago, um, towards the end of 2019, you know, while we were all still working in offices and things like that. Um, the comms team at FreeAgent and some of the product teams had key performance indicators on you know, different parts of the customer journey. So a customer might come to the website, they would sign up for an account, and then they'd have to provide some basic setup details of their account, you know, to get started, put in some accounting dates, set up a bank account, that sort of thing. And, you know, there'd been talk going around for, for a little while of, oh, you know, the, the, the setup completion rate for customers in the direct segment it seems to be really going down. And, you know, people had talked about it a bit. There was some concern that maybe we were running marketing campaigns that were bringing in colder customers or that there was some technical problem. And I, I was aware this had been talked about for a while. And I, I had an afternoon or so free in uh, March or April last year. In fact, I was probably that was about the time we, we all kind of started working from home and I was sitting around in a dazed state, perhaps not totally sure what to do with myself. So I sort of went back a bit to my comfort zone and thought, well, I'll pick up this problem. I mean, as I said, I when I started at Free Agent, I worked in the comms team, so I was fairly familiar with the acquisition data and a few simple things that you could do to, to investigate a problem like this. So the first thing I did was simply verify the, the problem. So I, I used Looker, our business intelligence tool, to just reproduce the curve of um, of setup completion efficiency. And I saw indeed, you know, around about September, there was a, there was a, in the previous year, there was a big fall. So, okay, the problem's real. That was kind of step one. You know, quite often people inflate problems because they want somebody to, to get involved. So, you know, it's always a good step to try and reproduce the problem when somebody comes to you with something. So then I thought, all right, well, you know, we have different types of customers. So, you know, you could be a sole trader or a limited company and, and free agent primarily uh, caters for the UK market, but we do have some US company types with a little bit of localization for US companies and a universal type for which which any company in the world can can use. Although obviously the functionality is a little bit lower than than for a UK company who can file self assessment in in the UK, for example. And I saw that well, okay, there's a big drop in this red line around September. That was universal companies. So I thought, okay, well, you know, we're starting to narrow it down a little bit now. What's the next step? I thought, okay, let's see if we can sort of close the loop on this and show, well, okay, the, the effect's probably coming from these u universal companies. So I looked at the, the number of universal companies that we were acquiring over time, and I saw, indeed, around September, when the problem started to happen, the acquisition rate for universal companies seemed to go way up. So we're adding more customers of a particular kind that seem to be less likely to complete setup. So therefore the, the total setup completion rate is going to go down. So, okay, we sort of got a little bit of color around the problem now, and maybe we can start to look into what the cause might be. Let's recap. So setup completion rate was reported to have dropped, and we found that the problem could be explained by a new source of universal company customers that were less likely to fully set up their account than other customer types. And there's there's a few typical hypotheses you can bat around for something like this. You might consider a marketing campaign bringing in colder signups. For example, quite often we do paid advertising and sometimes that brings in customers who have different expectations of what the product actually does. And when they get in, they realize they have to do something they weren't quite prepared for, you know, so they, they drop out. You know, that, that does happen sometimes. And where you can usually detect what those campaigns are and then shut them down. Uh, another pro possible problem, application faults affecting universal company types. OK, now we know a bit more about where the problem's happening. You know, that gives us some guidance of where to delve into the logs and, the, and our sort of exception handling systems to see, you know, is there something going wrong there? 
third possible option, something we've seen before, which is a problem common to many software as a service um, providers is, is what we call nefarious signups or, or sometimes spam signups. I'm gonna to refer to them as spam signups in this talk, which is where you know, quite often spammers will use some sort of network of bots to, to sign up for software as a service products in the hope that they can then take over those accounts and you know and start to use them to send out emails. So for example, free agent sends invoices by email. So spammers might be interested in signing up for free agent accounts to see if they can hijack uh, free agents somehow. So obviously we need to bring in defenses against that. So you know to try and get an idea what which of these hypotheses is more likely, you know, let's do another really simple thing, which is actually just look at the data. So the next thing I did was all right, let's let's inspect some basic properties of some of these some of these customers who are universal customers they've signed up since september you know let's just do a little bit of sampling and see if there's anything odd and immediately i can see that there's a few sign ups starting to to trickle in that have you know very obviously phony company names first names and last names of the business owner i mean these these very much look made up so you know i'm going to go with the the spam hypothesis here as being most likely. So here was the problem I was faced with. Okay, we've got some evidence that there's companies signing up for our application that are likely to be caused by some sort of spam bot, you know, signing up phony customer accounts with phony account details. So, you know, can we actually build a model of some kind to efficiently distinguish these spam customers from a genuine customer sign up. So here's, here's an example of a, a genuine customer sign up in, in comparison to a spam one, you know, company name, my company, something first name Dave, last name Evans, you know, obviously looks quite different in terms of the pattern of, of letters that follow each other and capitalization and spaces and so on, you know, very, very different structurally. So, you know, what, what can we do there? So, I thought, right, well, first of all, we're going to need to define a, you know, a training data set for our model and a test data set for our model. And we're going to need to be able to split that between those that are non spam customers and those that are spam customers. So, I mean, I did that by extracting the data from our web application using Ruby. So I basically had a big CSV file. And then I used, um, I actually loaded some of the data with some attributes populated, some general ones like the company type, the date of the sign up and the, the company name, and I loaded them into Google Sheets. And basically, for the months where I knew the problem had been occurring from the charts I showed previously, I just went through manually and labeled a large number of those customers uh, as, as spam or, or non-spam. I mean, that was a little, it wasn't as time consuming as it sounds. It took about an hour or so. And, you know, there's another little maybe moral of the story in here. You know, sometimes just just doing things by hand is probably the quickest way of getting something done. I think there's a really good XKCD cartoon somewhere that shows, you know, is something worth automating, you know, depending on how long it takes to do one example and how often you have to do it. So now I have my data sets, I could start to look into it in a little bit more detail. And what I wanted to do was was take a sort of letter to letter transition approach. And at this point, this was just a, a little bit of a almost a little, a little hobby that I, I chipped away at in between meetings over the course of a couple of days. And I thought, right, let's let's construct a transition matrix for identified um, non-spam signups and identified spam signups and, and have a look at what the difference is. And on, on the left, you can see a heat map for the, the non-spam companies. And you can see it's, it's really interesting because immediately you can see you know, properties that we know about the English language coming out. So for example, you know, the, the transition between Q and U, the darkest uh, square on the left plot, you know, is, is the highest, the most likely transition. If you've got a Q, you're most likely to, to transition to a U and so on, you know, V and I there is quite common. And likewise, you can see some letters like Z and uh, Y or Y to Z, very unlikely. Whereas with the spam uh, case, you know, it, it's maybe hard to see the variance from this uh, heat map, but the transition probabilities between letters were fairly similar regardless of, of what the letter was. So I don't know if I've, oh, I missed a slide here, sorry. 
So I was going to say that the way I did this was to use, uh, I used the Markov chain package in R. I mean, I, I don't want to dwell too much over the code. I mean, basically, I just used the Markov chain fit function, allowing for possible states that were letters and splitting strings uh, just on on uh, on no no character, as, as shown in the, one of the first couple of lines there. And I restricted things just to just to letters, so as to rem uh, remove various characters to keep the transition matrices to a nice visualizable size. I did the test training split just by generating a random number. And I think, you know, the key thing for me was in terms of the R aspect of this, you know, it was really succinct, didn't require much code, really easy to do just to get something up and running, uh, didn't take much time. So yeah, you know, that's, that's I think why I would sort of recommend R as a, as a technique for, for small scale problems like this. So skip over this slide again. So you know how, how do we actually use this? I want I want to build a discriminator now between spam and non-spam signups. So basically, what I, I did was I'll say we'll, we'll construct a variable which is the probability of the string in the context that we think it's spam divided by the probability of the string in the context we think it's spam plus the probability of the string given we think it's non-spam. So for exa an example here would be taking the, the, the product of the transitions for a word like hello. So I've tabulated the, the transition probability for each of the letters to the next letter in the word hello in the context of spam or in the context of non-spam. And then we can see we, we get a ratio for the word hello, which is uh, 0.0144. So what we can do now, this formulation, it has the advantage that we're sort of normalizing out the effect of strings with more or less letters. I mean, obviously, the more letters we have, the smaller the total probability of all of the letters in the entire sequence is going to be. So that, that dividing out there, that, that's really, really helpful to solve that problem. Uh, now we just need to pick a, a threshold to cut on on our variable. So for that, I built a, a precision recall curve for my classifier, and I arrived at a threshold, for example, of uh, 0.9999 for something to be um, be uh, non-spam, and using using that threshold, I mean, I can construct a confusion matrix on my test data, and I can see immediately that you know the, the classifier is quite good. I mean, it gets 99.6% of spam signups are classified as spam, and signups that are classified as as spam are 92.6% spam. Uh, with a false positive rate of about 1.2%. So you can see, you know, you know, most of the spam gets classified as spam. Not much of the non-spam gets classified as spam. So looks, you know, looks looks pretty good at this stage. You know, you know, I started to think, okay, well, you know, maybe we need to code this up in Ruby and implement it as part of our web app. You know, run it as a service in AWS might be useful for starting to filter out some of these spam signups that we've that we've seen and stopping them from getting access to the application. But, you know, here comes the, the but, right, which is, again, you know, inspecting the actual data is really important. It's sometimes too, um, it's sometimes too easy with machine learning models to, to end up focusing on the, you know, the metrics, precision recall and, and so on, that area under the rock curve. But sometimes it does pay to just, just look at some of the false positives. And I'm, I'm not going to actually tabulate any of the real false positives here just to avoid customer PII. But, you know, if we take a look at the names of, of Polish companies, for example, I mean, about half of the false positives that we got were non-English language companies. I mean, we can kind of immediately see why if we look at, for example, you know, the Polish language here, we can see that some of those transitions like Y to Z, Z to Y, that are very unlikely in the, relatively unlikely in the English language matrix occur much more frequently in, in one that would be trained on on Polish language. So okay, you know, we've got a relatively small number of false positives, but they're disproportionately gonna affect uh, minority groups that are trying to use free agents. So that's not good. So you know, again here here's the, the transition matrix for ham. So you know we can see for example that that some letter transitions are relatively unlikely in the the transition matrix, and we kind of immediately see why this is going to be because most free agent customers 
uh, come from the English speaking world. So when we train this model, you know, we, we've just reflected, we've just reflected that training data. So that really was the point of the talk, you know, to think a bit about the unintended consequences of machine learning. So, you know, because the model we've constructed is quite comprehensible, we're looking at transitions between letters, which is something that we, we can rely on as a, as a human, you know, quite easily. We can look at something and we can say, well, this looks like a human language. You know, it seems to have a, a certain set of transitions of characters. I mean, at least in, you know, as, as speakers of a, a, a language that uses Roman characters, and I, I imagine, you know, a speaker of a, a language that uses another character set would be able to recognize when something was, was nonsense in that character set or when something was a valid word, even if they didn't know the word. So it's clear to see why biases might be introduced from different languages uh, as well with this, with this model. So this, this made a really interesting talking point, and I, I plan to use the model as an example when explaining these sort of potential problems with machine learning, you know, in some internal work I'm doing but free agent, you know, for, for people in the engineering team, the wider team, but free agent, and as well, maybe a little bit more outreach on, on the subject. I'm thinking about writing a blog post on it. So I wanted to get all of your opinions on, you know, this example, whether, whether or not it's a good one. Um, you know, in general, machine learning techniques will learn to reproduce the characteristics in the input data. So you can always introduce biases in minority of groups that, that appear infrequently in that training data. And even if a model that achieves a very high precision and recall, it might still have substantive biases against those minority groups. So it's really something to be very aware of. So I mean, what, what can you do about it? Well, I mean, I think the, the number one thing is, be, you know, just be aware of this. Be aware that when you train a machine learning model, it will reflect biases in the training data. So for example, in what I've shown here, there were very few non-English language customers in the training sample. So we biased against non-English language customers. Another example, which I'm, I'm sure I read somewhere in the past, you know, there was a, an example of a company who I think wanted to make their hiring pipeline uh, more diverse. So they thought, right, well, instead of, instead of um, relying on these really biased human reviewers of CVs, we'll get rid of all of that. We'll train a machine learning model because that's sure to be better. But of course, they ran into the trap of training that model on uh, you know, their prior hiring decisions that were made by the humans. So naturally, the model grew to uh, to reflect them and highly score exactly the same kinds of people that the humans were were highly scoring. So, you know, how, how, how can you deal with this? Well, first of all, I mean, I think you've really got to inspect the model performance across different subject groups. So, you know, make a real effort to verify how your model performs across diverse groups. And if you do find subject groups with considerably different behavior, then maybe it's worth considering, you know, reweighting the training data, maybe stratification or rebalancing the training data sets in some other way. In our particular example, so what did we do? Well, actually, you know what? We just didn't use the model because we realized that the spam signups because they were coming from some sort of bot, it was disabling some JavaScript features that are actually a hard requirement that we make it clear to our customers have to be enabled to be able to use our application. So we just introduced a validation that was missing to check that. So that's a, actually turned out to be quite a simple technical engineering fix. But the way we actually came to that fix was because a whole bunch of engineers got interested in reading about this model in, in some documentation that I circulated internally and got thinking about it. So sometimes, you know, using models as a talking point about a problem can be a really interesting way of getting, you know, getting more brains and eyes looking at it and, and thinking about it. So that's something that worked really well for us. So yeah, that's more or less all I want to say about uh, the unintended consequences of machine learning. And in fact, I'm sure there's probably a lot more unintended consequences of machine learning than what I've talked about here, but, but hopefully it'll get people thinking a little bit about what they may, may be if you're actually using machine learning techniques in your in your work or, or some other personal project. Uh, obligatory message, you know, we're, we're hiring at free agent. In particular, we've got um, positions open at the moment for analytics interns and data science interns. Uh, that's for this summer, the closing dates coming up in a couple of weeks. So if anyone here is interested in that or knows someone who might be interested in that, we're typically looking at undergraduates or PhD students, an opportunity 
come and work with the team for three months over the summer, either on the analytics side, maybe looking at statistical modeling, we're thinking about a potential project there on uh, modeling customer lifetime value, or on the data science side, where there'll be some con contributions to some natural language processing work to classify customer bank transactions. So if anyone has any questions about any of that, uh, give me a shout on email, or you can find me on Twitter or LinkedIn. There's some of my some of my coordinates, or you can have a look at the free agent jobs page uh, itself where you'll find the full job descriptions. So that's more or less all I wanted to say for today. Does anyone have any questions? Thanks very much, Dave. Uh, I thought I'd very rapidly jump in. Um, it was really interesting, and I, I, yeah, I read a Cathy O'Neill's Weapons of Math Destruction uh, last year, and it's yeah, there's so many echoes of of the the examples in her book um, in in what could have happened if you'd had him, uh, implemented it. Uh, I've I've dropped a link to the Wikipedia page in the chat. It's it's well worth a, you know sort of a day or two of folks' time to have a read. Um, I have dropped some questions in, so I'm happy to uh, to kick off. Um, but if uh, oh, hang on, I think we might be getting some more in the, the sidebar as well. Uh, so, so very rapidly, um, did you consider using uh, name lists, so things like the National Records of Scotland, um, like that, so you could do a lookup and say, well, actually, these are our potential suspect ones because the names don't exist in names that people have been called. You're on mute, Dave. Or if I can change that. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a really interesting interesting point. I mean, as I sort of said in the talk, this was a, a sort of quick study over the course of a, a couple of days that turned out to be used a bit more as a as a talking point around machine learning than an actual solution in production. But I think had we taken it further, then doing something like that could have could have been an avenue to follow. I think it would be interesting that you, then you'd ask the question, okay, does the National Records of Scotland dataset contain a diverse enough set of names given that we're we've got customers from other parts of the world but then i'm, I'm not familiar with the with the data set itself so that, that may be that may still be uh be valid okay fantastic uh, we've got a question from miriam that i'm sort of digesting but actually that's not my job it's your job to digest it uh, <clears throat> so miriam says speaking as a linguist i immediately wondered whether you might want to use models of linguistic structure for the set of languages you expect your customers to use similar to the transitional properties you use but restricted to the data at hand and then declare those somewhere or just play with it to see how that changes the rate of false positives yeah i think i think had we had we carried on with this I think that would have been probably a next step to, to take because we could have trained a transition uh, probability matrix separately for the UK and US company types and for the universal company type, which is where we would expect a much more diverse set of, of languages. And within that, we could easily, based on customer location uh, data that we have, have trained uh, separate models for our major languages. Um, I've got a question from yeah. Iris. Um, would be interesting to do an aggregate transition matrix for all spoken languages. Uh, I wonder if that will look like the spam. <laughs> that's that's an interesting question. I my gut feeling would be that it will just it will be closer to spam. I mean, it will because presumably we will see it will be like a, a sum of all the possible different transitions that are common in in different languages so my feeling is yeah it would probably turn out that way and simply be a bit less efficient at rejecting spam for english language companies and potentially a bit less biased for, for non-english language companies fantastic um if there aren't any other questions uh i'd like to say a big thanks to to dave and uh, and definitely get in touch if you're interested in jobs. Um, I, I put up a post about um, some jobs last year and uh, for a company that I, I don't actually work at. And, uh, and I got a thank you in the new year saying that they'd hired someone who'd seen the, uh, the advert here. So uh, it definitely, I think it's a good thing to be doing, Dave. Um, oh, there's some, yeah, some thanks in, yeah. The, in the chat. Uh, so um, if you could stop sharing your slides and we can hand uh, screen sharing over to Eric.
All right, we'll get this uh, squared away. Okay, while you're doing that, uh, I shall read out the spiel. Uh, so, Eric Nance is a principal research scientist at a large life sciences company, creating innovative analytical pipelines and capabilities, supporting study designs and analyses. Out of his day job, Eric is passionate about connecting with the R community as the creator, host of the R podcast, Shiny Developer Series, and the recently launched R Weekly Highlights podcast. So, over to you, Eric. Thank you very much. Um, can you all confirm you can see my screen? Yep. Great. Okay. So this is going to be a pretty practical talk, um, but I've been wanting to, to share a lot of these ideas. And while it's not my first time talking about Shiny, um, I'll kind of have a message throughout this is that if you're just getting started with it or you're trying to kind of level up your skills with Shiny, this is one of the best times to get involved as opposed to perhaps when I got involved earlier on. Um, and the slides are available online. I'll put a link in the uh, sidebar there if you want to follow along as I go. So let's get to this. So first, yeah, hello, everybody. Um, so I, my day job is, as um, in the introduction, kind of working in life sciences, but you can also find me as a bit of an advocate or, um, you know, a spreader of the greatness of R in different ways. Um, I'm mostly known for my voice, as was alluded to earlier, so you can find the links to my podcast site and the Shiny Dev series, and I'm also a curator for the R Weekly group, which has been a lot of fun as well. So let's get into it. So what you're seeing here is some of the snapshots of the official Shiny gallery that's put up by our studio, but in recent years, you started to see not just some kind of demo type applications that they would they would uh, construct for their various efforts. Um, we've seen others in the community take Shiny to directions that frankly, I never even thought possible. And so you have all these different categories here. You can definitely look at this at your leisure afterwards. But as I look at these, and I've seen talks in maybe presenting a shiny application at a conference years ago, I would be so amazed that how on earth did they get to make such awesome applications? Now, as I mentioned earlier, um, I was an early adopter of shiny way back when it was um, created almost five or six years ago, I believe now. And really the only way to find out what others were doing and kind of a little bit into how they got there was the Shiny mailing list on Google Groups. Um, many of the Shiny developers at the time, uh, mainly Joe Chang, would actually be in this group frequently to answer questions. Um, one of my better R friends, so to speak, Dean Natelli, was a frequent poster here. And I would be more of a lurker because I was still pretty new to Shiny, and I'm trying to figure out, okay, I've kind of glued some of these things together, but what are others doing to kind of take their take their applications to another level? And admittedly, a lot of this went over my head, and sometimes you would only see like a brief snippet of code, but you wouldn't really see how they got there or a demo that was online that we could play with. Sometimes they would be able to share it, but other times it was, of course, proprietary stuff. So you see these amazing possibilities and I would even start to see it not too long after Shiny was introduced, but I was struggling at that time with how can I go from creating simple prototypes that you would often see in the official Shiny tutorials to those like full blown, you know, really robust, powerful web applications where sometimes you would look at it and you would have absolutely no idea that that was made with Shiny. Like you would not be able to tell. You would think it was made by a full stack web developer or software engineer. So sometimes I would ask myself, do I need to become that other side, so to speak, of development? Or, am, you know, how can I get to that level? Well, I venture to say that in the recent years, in particular since last year especially, you now have a few resources available that is going to help you make that transition of going from this kind of prototyping stage 
to creating more intermediate or complex applications without feeling completely overwhelmed and you being able to understand how to get there. Now, of course, everybody's journey is unique, but I can say with experience that what I'm about to show you has already helped me immensely in my day work and even some of my uh, fun projects outside of this. So the first resource I want to plug is um, called Engineering Production Grade Shiny Apps. This has been written by the team at Think R, who some of you may be familiar with. And this, pro this, uh, this uh, online book, which will be available for print later on, has literally been in my like tab of my browser every time I'm working on a Shiny app. They talk about not just like what Shiny is, of course, or like what production means, they're talking about the process to get there. Trust the process, which was a famous uh, quote from a NBA uh, uh, general manager when they were rebuilding their team. And but the idea is that this whole this whole process it's an intricate process. And the other ideas behind this book is that if you embrace and really adhere to a software mindset you will put yourself in a much better position position for success and throughout the book they leverage using their um, open source package called golem which turns your application into an r package which already as those of you that use r quite frequently know the power of the packaging mechanism you got your documentation of functions you've got guides perhaps optional vignettes and you it just makes you adhere to other principles just in R itself. So why not take advantage of that with Shiny as well? And there are lots of nuggets in this book that before I read it, I either just never even thought about or I just never even thought were possible. And I'm going to demonstrate one of them. We'll take a diversion on a concept called backend prototyping. And so I'm going to go to my other tab here where um, I what they advocate is the idea of shiny applications are typically made of not just front-end components but a heck of a lot of back-end components and why not prototype your business logic like all this back-end functionality in something that not only you can relate to with others if you're on like a, a development team but future you will be able to understand why you're choosing the choices you make in terms of setting up kind of the the foundation of the app and they advocate a great approach of if your application is already a package of this golem framework why not make it a vignette of like these different ideas that you're using for your business logic and then be able to fold that back in to your shiny app when you're ready instead of starting with the application right away and trying to mix the business logic and the whole dynamic interfaces and all the other bits that Shiny has, which can be quite overwhelming if you do that right away. So what I've done here is I've been involved in a kind of a fun uh, side, you might say excursion with uh, a group of friends online to do some online racing. There's a whole fun backstory behind that we don't have time for. But I wanted to help with kind of collecting real-time data as we're doing these races within the game that we're participating in. And so I figured, okay, I want to make an app for it just because it's a great learning opportunity. But I needed to figure out what I'll, again, call the business logic of grabbing information from the images that the, the game will produce. And so I figured, why not make a vignette out of it in the app I'm working on? So in our studio, it gets even easier now because you have the now interactive R markdown mode. So I can kind of share, share this in demonstrations for if this is for, say, another project and kind of present my ideas but have it look really nice as we're seeing here. So we don't have time to get into what all of this is doing. But the idea behind what I'm doing in this vignette is setting up the problem of I've got this screenshot of racing results. I want to grab the names and the, the finishing times 
in an automated way instead of me pulling up some spreadsheet like an Excel or LibreOffice or whatever and manually typing this in, why not take advantage of some of the tech that our, the R community has to dynamically grab all this out? And so this is a great chance for me to play with some newer technologies that uh, Thomas Mock from our studio had talked about in one of his posts on scraping data from image files with the magic package, a wrapper to image magic, and OCR via the Tesseract engine. So you can see here is that this vignette is me kind of setting things up and trying stuff out, and I'm able to run the code chunks dynamically. I've imported my image. I try like my first approach at knitting things. And then, um, yeah, let, let's do that. I'm cropping things, I'm all that stuff. So it's a little odd scrolling here. But the idea is that this is all setting up kind of my prototyping of this logic before I get to the app. And so, yeah, is this based on Shiny itself? No, not yet. But again, it's the principle of being able to figure out your optimal techniques for development, but being able to know that your application is already likely going to get complex enough. Why make it harder on yourself to jump into all this head first? And why not just figure out the foundations of it first and then be able to set this up more easily later on? And so if we have time, I'll even show the rest of the app. But the idea is that this is about the process of developing an app with, of course, a whole bunch of tips that are thrown in as you're going forward. So I highly recommend um, Engineering Production Shiny. It is, like I said, it's open in my, in my toolbox every single time. And so I use it extensively to this day. So now another one that came out or has been in development around the same time that some has gotten some attention recently is Mastering Shiny from Hadley Wickham himself, who of course is chief scientist at our studio. And so what this book is in, in it's a bit different than Engineering Production Shiny. Um, in my opinion, this is a great balanced approach of having practical examples of you kind of getting started with Shiny, as well as being able to kind of demystify certain concepts of what's happening under the shiny hood. What most people get tripped on when they start with shiny is reactivity. Even I'm not nearly a master of it. Um, in one of the shiny dev conferences that was uh, many years ago, Joe Chang had a famous slide of like climbing the ladder of enlightenment as you're proceeding with your shiny skills. And I may never get to the very top level, but having a, a set of chapters in Mastering Shiny that Hatley is writing, able to kind of really translate some of those fundamentals of reactivity are only going to help you in that journey and give you a much better jump start than all of us old timers, so to speak, in the early days trying to figure out why the heck did that not that reactive output not refresh correctly or I change this input, what's going on? it's really a helpful way to go under that hood of something that seems very magical. But Hadley does a great job of, again, kind of demystifying that magic to be something that's a lot more tangible to uh, digest. And it also reinforces powerful techniques that you are probably using already for your general R you know, coding programming development. And that's like a functional approach and lots of things like that. But I'll share a nugget that's in this book. It's a dedicated chapter of something that I struggle with many, many times as I've been trying to blend my shiny application skills with the skills I've been learning with implementing things from the Tidyverse, which of course is um, Hadley's uh, group of packages that follow the Tidy philosophy. And that is, Tidy evaluation. Tidy evaluation is already what can be a very, very complex paradigm. And I always wondered how can I take advantage of some of the conciseness and the, you know, once you get into it, it, it can make sense. It just takes a while to get there. But my stumbling block was how do I link it with what I'm getting from like a shiny UI? 
And so I have a screenshot here of a demo app that he has in the book where it's a simple app where it's using the, the cars data set to select a variable, selecting a minimum value and a sorting, and it will just render the result in the data table below. But the idea is that how do we take the results of these kind of inputs and put them into a dplyr or do something, you know, something in a tidy framework and have it so that it translates directly. Well, the UI of this app is very basic, as I just mentioned. It's just a select input, a checkbox input, and a table output. But here's where the magic starts to happen on the server side, is that when you have a reactive of an object that you're gonna do for like sorting things, if we have a, an input for like ascending or descending order, and then also the idea of a, a variable being selected in that um, select input over here. This was something that I may have seen mentioned once or twice in other documents, but I had no idea it existed until I really saw Hadley tie it together in this chapter, is that when you're doing tidy evaluation, you have this dot data pro like um, object, if you will, and within a dplyr type pipeline or another tidyverse package pipeline, it's a, this is going to be the data frame that you supply to it, and then you can use the double bracket notation to grab that, and then this input var in a dropdown is a character va value. So a lot of times in the other tidyverse tutorials, you would always see them passing variable names unquoted or with like the bang bang in front or something like that. Well, with Shiny, you always get things from these inputs as strings. You will rarely get them as like that, that um, non-unquoted name. So now that I know this trick, I can now take those values of those inputs and use them effectively in my reactives that are going to be feeding into, say, a plot or a table or anything like that. And again, I will not preface to say that I've mastered this yet, but knowing that this pronoun is here and that it's a recommended approach for a Shiny app makes me feel better to kind of invest the time and really make all this happen as I try to kind of tie together these, what could be very different um, development mindsets of like the Tidyverse, programming with the Tidyverse, and developing a Shiny app. So there's obviously much more in mastering Shiny that I'm getting to know very well. And I definitely look forward to learning more as I go. And then the last resource I'll highlight, and there's definitely more than this, is another book that's in, in progress right now by David Grangin, um, who now works at a, a pharmaceutical company called Outstanding User Interfaces with Shiny. This is amazing because up until this point, we have not had a dedicated comprehensive resource like this that is dedicated, very much focused on what you see when you create a Shiny app. And when you create a Shiny app, a lot of times you're building it for others who may not know R, but they want to take advantage of like your algorithms, your pipelines without having to be an expert in R itself. Well, David, does such a thorough job of translating these web development type concepts with things like CSS, JavaScript, and be able to give it an approach, an approachable framework, and you can kind of see how he has developed and others of his colleagues have developed these awesome front end packages like BS4 Dash or Shiny Dashboard Plus, and how he took a template online and then be able to translate the, C, the, the different style bits and everything like that into a dedicated package so that people like me, who is self-professed novice at web development, be able to make my apps look like, you know, very professional. And so this book does an awesome job already, even in its kind of midway stage, of setting up these different recipes that you can generalize later on and apply to your situation if you find a nice template online and you're wondering, well, no one else has done it for Shiny yet, what can I do? You now have the tools from this book to figure those connections out. And uh, the little chapter I've linked to here is some work that he's done with a Shiny mobile package 
which if you ever needed to create a mobile Shiny app, you better start here because he's done all this hard work for you to make this so much easier to style it in a way that's compliant with mobile devices, which was, I remember seeing his tweet about it a year or so ago, and I had done very basic things trying this out, but I never got far with it. So when he wrapped what's called the F7 framework to make it so that I could pull up an app on my, on my Android phone and have it look almost exactly like a native you know, phone app, it was a game changer to maybe some things I want to do later on. As like in my industry, we're trying to get more digital with the data we collect. And imagine having a shiny app that maybe gets in the hands of say a patient and we want them to record say their observations instead of filling out paperwork they could just go to a mobile app and if it was connected with shiny maybe that feeds into some database or something so i'm just kind of saying off the cuff so to speak but having these awesome interfaces and having a resource like this to translate all these different links that you might again say are magical like how to get JavaScript, custom JavaScript to link with a server session in your Shiny app. It's amazing to have this available. So I highly recommend looking at this. And one fun thing I did um, to take advantage of one of the tips he has is this is kind of late breaking a little bit, but the RStudio team has authored a package called BSLib to help you get a lot of styling into your Shiny app with very minimal changes and not necessarily having to be the huge uh, CSS ninja, so to speak, to make all it look good. And so I made a fun app for this little side venture I'm on where we needed to randomly select a car for our game. And I made a probably the most over-the-top random number generator selector ever because behind the scenes it's really just selecting a number from one to eight for each driver, but I wanted to have fun with it. I wanted to style it like the game had. And so what I was able to do, as you can see a screenshot of the app, it looks not really like Shiny at all, right? Uh, but the theme, the BS Lib package, lets you define basically what's called a theme object. And you select, you can supply at minimum a background, foreground color, a color for like the primary elements and a font, and then you're basically done because then you can just use this within your your um, scaffolding of the UI where you just feed a theme parameter as of Shiny 1.6. This is all possible. So again, I went from not knowing much CSS but then making an app that looks really slick with lots of theming throughout, and this I'm just gonna show this because I because I can. I love doing demos, and you can see every font is styled similarly. Um, the buttons look great. I, even the reactable table that I have below is in the same color scheme as I wanted throughout the application. It's just to me amazing that now not only do I have resources to kind of level up my skills for this, but I have the packages to help take advantage of it and get me introduced to doing all this customization without necessarily requiring me to be the expert in these methodologies. And so I've really had fun with this recently and I hope to explore more of this, uh, more of this uh, down the road. So I'll wrap up with this is that what seemed to be, at least in my early stages, something that I would never ever attain to is within reach now. Because unlike those early days that I mentioned, just we, I even just showed you three of these resources that are out there, but there's much more coming in the pipeline, and they'll get you closer to wherever you want to go with making your shiny apps robust in production and be able to get everything you want achieved in there. Now, as I mentioned, there's much more out there. One that's new as of a week ago is the shiny team at our studio is, has a new section called Shiny App Stories, on the main Shiny site where they're going to talk about specific features that Shiny offers but have more narrative around how they work and why you want to use it. And my kind of passion project that I started a couple years ago or so is the Shiny Developer Series where we showcase the community behind all these great extensions in the Shiny ecosystem 
And recently I've gotten my hands a little bit dirty, so to speak, and done a couple live streams of me trying to do some shiny development where I'm learning some of these new skills. And in my latest live stream, I did um, a deep dive into those racing applications that I just referenced. So if you want to kind of see how I went by, went about the code development, you'll want to check that out sometime if you're interested. But yeah, that's that's all I wanted to say for today. Um, certainly thank you all for listening, and I'll be glad to start taking some questions. Thanks, Eric. That's a, a really useful list of uh, yeah of support documents. I've definitely been beavering away, grabbing lots of hyperlinks. Um, we did get a question in. Uh, where are we gone? From Rian. Uh, have you come across scenarios where the workflow set out in engineering production grade shiny apps isn't appropriate or is lacking? So I'll admit I'm probably a bit biased here because my I have gone and like in part of my day job my I'm in a what we call a capabilities group where I'm making R packages I'm making shiny applications that are definitely not just like these one-off things that you throw over the wall once and be done with it. They are really big time software products. So for me, I have not encountered any time in my work where it's been limiting or it's had a, a section that doesn't quite cover it. Now, I will say that they don't try to cover everything to level up your skills in each area, but they have great resources to point to. If like you wanna get better with JavaScript itself, they have some resources they link to. And they do just enough about the styling to kind of get you started, but they don't go as in depth as David is doing with the outstanding shiny UI book. So they admittedly don't try to cover the full spectrum of all that you can do with shiny, but they try to make sure that the process that they outline is something that at least in my opinion, you can take advantage of even if your application is not quite as complex as, say, a, a, a huge web product that you're making at your organization or your group, but but that's a good question. But so far, I've been I've been uh, a big fan of their approach, and I haven't hit any roadblocks just yet. Excellent. Um, I've got a question on yeah. um, on making mobile apps. Uh, sure. A lot of my work involves things like maps, which obviously are really hard to overlay with graphs and other features if you're working on mobile. I was wondering if you'd come across any other limitations of, of trying to port things or use uh, Shiny apps on mobile. Yeah, I think a lot of it depends on the widgets you incorporate in the application and how responsive they are. Um, not Most of the time, the widgets I've been using, and I have not done a whole lot with Shiny Mobile yet. I had um, a fun side project where I did like a, a very random audio thing that I had a mobile app to kind of listen to my episodes. Um, I didn't haven't maintained it, but it was just a set of a couple tables and some like a slider or or drop downs. Um, I think it really depends on the the responsiveness of it, so that when you're at a reduced resolution, does it still show enough of a display that the user can really interact with efficiently? But I think the other part is just how how much resources do these widgets take? And a lot of these JavaScript widgets, some of them are very uh, taxing on your system. So that can be an issue I think is just performance sometimes. And maybe there are some more streamlined widgets out there that are meant just for mobile that you can take advantage of. But for mapping, I think that is a very complex one. Um, I know a lot of people use a leaflet and maybe that works well with Shiny Mobile. But I just don't have enough experience of mapping to know kind of the other nuts and bolts of that. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions uh, before we thank Eric? Um, so I've got multiple, multiple chat windows open, busy scanning across them to see if something's appeared in one and not the other. Uh, OK, that's grand. Um, Feel well. I was going to say, feel free, people, to to unmute and thank um, Eric and Dave for for two fantastic talks this evening. Uh, awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah, fantastic work. Thanks both. They were they were really great talks. Thank you. Uh, one thing I oh, yeah.
One thing I'd like to say before we round off is we have more space for speakers. So uh, if anyone's interested in speaking, either hang around at the end or, or drop us a message on uh, Twitter or um, LinkedIn or email or all of those other kinds of services. Um, Greg has been talking about putting a contact page on uh, the website as well. So uh, hopefully that will be up and running imminently. Um, but I, yeah, I think we've got some space next month um, and then possibly again in May. But uh, otherwise, thanks very much to both of our speakers. It was a lot of fun to be here. I really appreciate the invitation. Yeah. Welcome anytime. Excellent. Thanks for having me.